Suspense. Tonight's Suspense brings you an all-star cast of Hollywood's finest radio players in 100 in the Dark. But first, wherever hospitality is a gracious art and entertaining is the last word in luxury, the first name in wines is (laughs) C-R-E-S-T-A B-L-A-N-C-A Cresta Blanca Cresta Blanca Yes, that's Cresta Blanca Wines, a symbol of perfect taste, of gracious living. To pay your guests a sincere compliment, distinguish your holiday dining by serving a fine Cresta Blanca California Burgundy or Sauterne. When you pour these proud Cresta Blanca wines from the finest of the vines, you enjoy the best. Shenley's Cresta Blanca Wine Company, Livermore, California. And now, Shenley brings you radio's outstanding theater of thrills... Suspense! Presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A. Roma Wines, for your enjoyment. Tonight, Roma Wines of Fresno, California, presents One Hundred in the Dark, a study in suspense. Produced, edited, and directed for Shenley by William Spear. was a fine meal indeed. Me for the club any time. Here. You can all sit here, Quinny. Oh, yes, yes. If you'll just draw up that chair for Mr. Peters. There you are, Peters. Yes. Thank you. Do you all know Peters? Mm-hmm. Oh, this is Mr. Steingall. How do you do? Glad to know you. Mr. DeGalia. Yeah, I believe we've met. Oh, yes, how are you? You know each other. And the one who drew up your chair, Mr. Rankin. <laughs> all right. the chair. Well, I guess we're all acquainted. <laughs> now, <clears throat> to get back to our table discussion. Please. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, how about some coffee? All of us, eh? Oh, yes. Oh, oh fine. Like oh, John, coffee. John. Well, now, Steingall, as I said, there are only half a dozen stories in the world. What is more to the point, there's every... Uh... Yes, sir? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, coffee, John. Uh, anything else, anybody? No, nothing. I don't think I care. Oh, yes, sir. Now, where was I? Oh, yes. Human relations are so simple and yet so fundamental that they can be eternally played upon, redressed and reinterpreted in every language, in every age. They remain inexhaustible in the possibility of variations. Well, that's true, of course. Yeah, well, that's very possible. Well, now, but you, you... Uh, take the eternal triangle. Uh, two men and a woman, or two women and a man. Its variations extend into the thousand. <laughs> that right, Rankin? Well, in a way, yes. But <laughs> oh, yes, it's... coffee. Yes, just set them right down. I'm afraid we, we can't see eye to eye, Quinny. Mm-hmm. Now, I believe there are situations, original situations, that are independent of your human emotions. Yes? They exist just because they are situations. Accidental and nothing else. Now, as for instance. Well, I, uh, I'll cite just an ordinary one that happens to come to my mind. Well? Now, you take in a, in a group of five men, such as we are here, a, uh, a theft takes place. A theft. Hmm. One man is the thief. Which one? Now, I now I'd, like, I'd, oh, I'd yeah. like to know what emotion that interprets. And yet it certainly is an original theme. It's at the bottom of a whole literature. Mm. Well, that's no. safety at all. Take this story. I could no. answer yeah. that certainly the situation can. you give can be traced back to the commonest of human emotions, curiosity. I think when he has you there, Rankin. Yes. Why, the whole art of a detective story consists in the statement of the problem. Why, anyone can do it. I can do it. Steingall can do it. Well, I don't Rankin, know. I believe even you can yeah. do it. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. The solution yeah. doesn't count. It's usually well, banal. It should be prohibited. What interests us is, can we guess it? Yeah, I suppose that's true. Now, every it... crime expresses itself in the terms of the picture puzzle that you feed to your six-year-old. It's only the variation that is interesting. <clears throat> you know, the well-known instance of the visitor at a club and the rare coin, for example. Of course, uh, you all know that one. No, oh, I don't. Oh, well, I don't. It's, it's I don't very well known. Seems a distinguished visitor is brought into a club. Doesn't men say present at dinner, long table. Conversation finally veers around to curiosities and relics. One of the members then takes from his pocket what he announces as one of the rarest coins in existence. Passes it around the table. Mm-hmm. Coin travels back and forth. Everyone examines it, and the conversation goes to another topic. Who say the influence of the automobile on civilian life, or some <laughs> other such intellectual <laughs> club topic? You know. <laughs> All at once, the owner calls for his coin. And it's nowhere to be found. Yes, yes, precisely. Everyone looks at everyone else. First, they suspect a joke. Well, that's 
Then it becomes serious. The coin is immensely valuable. Now, who has taken it? The owner, as a gentleman, does the correct idiotic thing, of course, laughs. Says he knows someone is playing a practical joke on him and that the coin will be returned tomorrow. Now, the others refuse to leave the situation so. One man proposes they all submit to a search. Hmm. Everyone gives his consent until it comes to the stranger. <coughs> I refuse to allow my person to be searched. You see, he's very firm, very proud, very English. You know. <laughs> and I refuse to give the reason for my action. Well, there's another silence. The men eye him and then glance at one another. Now, what's to be done? Nothing. Oh, nothing. <laughs> there is etiquette, that magnificent inflated bloom. <laughs> the visitor evidently has the coin. He is their guest and etiquette protects him. Now, nice situation, eh? Well, the table is clear. A waiter removes a dish of fruit, and there, under the ledge of the plate, where it had been pushed, is the coin. Yeah, well, I heard yes, yes, of course, yeah. by now, no, explanation. Uh... I know, I know. I know. <coughs> Solutions always should be. At once, everyone is profuse with apologies. Whereupon the visitor rises and says, Now, I can give you the reason for my refusal to be searched. There are only two known specimens of the coin in existence, and the second happens to be here in my vest pocket. Mm. <laughs> Of course, the story is very well invented, but the turn to it is very nice, very nice indeed. Uh, well, I knew that story, I knew, but the, the ending, the ending, though, is too obvious to be invented. Think so? The visitor should have had on him, uh, not another coin, mm. but something absolutely different, something, uh, well, destructive, say, to a woman's reputation. Oh, dear. And a great tragedy should have been threatened with a casual misplacing of the coin. Uh -huh. well, I've heard the same story told in a dozen different ways. Oh, it's happened a hundred times. It must be continually happening. I, <clears throat> I uh, know one extraordinary instance. In fact, the uh, most extraordinary instance of this sort I've ever heard. Why, Peters, you rascal. I see you've quietly been letting us dress the stage for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, not a story that will please everyone. Oh, well, why not? Because you'll want to know what no one can ever know. It has no conclusion, then, huh? Uh, yes and no. As far as it concerns a woman, however, quite the most remarkable woman I've ever met, the story is complete. Ah, uh -huh. mm -hmm. it concerns a woman. A woman. And a crime. A crime of thievery, such as we've been discussing. Huh? A crime of thievery, yes. Quite a story. I think, uh, yes, I uh, have just time before I catch my train to tell it to you. <laughs> For Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you 100 in the Dark. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, selected for better taste from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines. Next week... Americans everywhere will celebrate Thanksgiving, and in millions of homes, families and friends will give a toast of thankfulness with better-tasting Roma California wines. That's because Roma wines are America's favorite wines for festive occasions as well as everyday enjoyment. No matter what you're planning for Thanksgiving dinner, there's a fine Roma wine to make every morsel a taste delight. Glorify the flavor of your turkey with golden-hued, delicate Roma Sauternes. Or if you're having meat, enjoy robust, full-bodied Roma Burgundy, the perfect flavor mate of your favorite roast. That's why more Americans enjoy Roma wines, that's R-O-M-A, Roma wines, than any other wines. And now, Roma wines bring us back to the Artists and Writers Club, where five club members regaling themselves over after-dinner coffee are settling down to hear a story told by a guest, a certain Mr. Peters. His is a narrative well calculated to keep his listeners in suspense. Uh, Quinny, uh, before I start, I wonder would you ask the, uh, the John, I believe is his oh, name? Oh, yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, sir, uh, John. Yes, gentlemen? Uh, John, I have a train to catch. Would you be good enough to get me out of here in exactly 15 minutes? In 15 minutes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> well, you have our attention, Peters. It concerns a woman. Uh, do I know the woman? Uh, Possibly. Uh, probably, I should say, but uh, no more than anyone else. Oh, an actress. Uh, what she's been in the past, I don't know. A promoter would better describe her. 
A very feminine woman, and yet, as you shall see, with an unusual, instantaneous, masculine power of uh, decision. Oh, well, Peters, you're destroying your story. Your preface will bring an anticlimax. <laughs> you shall be the judge. Of course, it uh, should be particularly interesting to you, because I believe most of you are acquainted with the people involved. Oh, really? The names uh, I shall use, of course, are disguises. Hmm. Mrs., uh, well, uh, Mrs. Rita Kildare inhabited a charming bachelor girl studio, very elegant of the duplex pattern, in one of the buildings just off Central Park West. She uh, knew pretty nearly everyone in that indescribable society in New York that is drawn from all levels and it imposes but one condition for membership, and that is to be a music. Uh, good phrase, that, Rita. Good, good phrase. She uh, had a certain amount of money... She knew a certain number of men in Wall Street affairs, and her studio was furnished with taste and even distinction. She was of any age. She might have suffered everything or nothing at all. In this mingled society, her invitations were eagerly sought, her dinners were spontaneous, and the discussions, though gay and usually daring, were invariably under the control of wit and good taste. On the uh, Sunday night of this adventure, she had... According to her invariable custom, sent away her Filipino butler and invited to an informal chafing dish supper seven of her more congenial friends. At seven o'clock, having finished dressing, she put in order her bedroom, which formed a sort of free passage between the studio and a small dining room with the kitchen beyond. Then, going into the studio, she struck a match and was about to light the candlesticks which illuminated the room. When the bell rang, and a Mr. Flanders, a broker... In fact, nervously alive, well-groomed, was waiting as she opened the door. Well, you're early. On the contrary, dear lady, you are late. Well, in any case, hello, and come on inside. Here, let me take your things. Thank you. I, uh, I'm the first, I suppose. Of course. And since you are, you can be a good boy and help me light the candles. Uh, delighted. Who's to be here tonight? The Enos Jacksons. Oh, I thought they were separated. Not yet. Oh, how interesting. Only you, dear lady, would dream of serving us a couple on the verge. Well, it is interesting, isn't it? Assuredly. Where did you know the Jacksons? Through the Warings. Uh, Jackson's a rather doubtful person, isn't he? Mm, let's call him a very sharp lawyer. Oh? Uh, they tell me, though, he's been gambling pretty much in deep. Oh, how about yourself? Oh, me? <laughs> I'm a bachelor, and if I lose my shirt, it makes no difference. Oh, is that possible? Probable, even. Oh. Uh, who else is coming? Oh, Maud Lyle. You know her? No, I don't think so. You do, too. You met her here some time ago, a journalist. Oh, yes, yes, I've forgotten. Mr. Harris, a club man, is coming. And the Stanley Cheevers. The Stanley Cheevers? Uh -huh. hmm. Are we going to gamble? Well, don't tell me you object. Oh, certainly not. Only the Cheevers, they play quite a game. Well united, and they have an unusual streak of good luck. Uh, say, by the way, it's Jackson, isn't it, who's so attractive to Mrs. Cheevers? Quite right. Well, what a charming party. Mm-hmm. And where does Maud Lyle come in? Oh, don't joke. She's in a desperate way. And young Harris? Oh, he, he used to make the salad and cream the chicken. <laughs> ah, I see the whole party. I, of course, am to add the element of respectability. Of what? <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> That's better. Ah, no one, of course, knows who's coming. No one, of course. The uh, uh, Stanley Cheevers entered, a short, fat man with a vacant, fat face and a slow-moving eye, and his wife, voluble, nervous, overdressed, and pretty. Mr., uh, yes, uh, Mr. Uh, Harris came with uh, Maud Lyle, a woman, straight, dark, Indian, with great masses of somber hair held in a little too least, uh, loosely for neatness, with thick, quick lips and eyes that rolled away from the person who was talking to her. I'm sorry, we're late. The uh, Enos My Jacksons wife. were late and still agitated as they entered. His forehead had not quite vanished the scowl, nor her eyes the scorn. He was of the type that never lost his temper, but caused others to lose theirs. Mrs. Jackson seemed fastened to her husband by an invisible leash. who looked at her curiously and wondered what such a nature would do in a crisis with a lurking sense of a woman who carried with her her own impending tragedy. As soon as the company had been completed and the incongruity of the selection had been perceived, a smile of malicious anticipation ran the rounds, which the hostess cut short. Well, well, now everyone is here. This is the order of the night. 
You can quarrel all you want. You can whisper all the gossip you can think of about one another. But, <laughs> but everyone is to be amusing. Also, also, everyone is to help with the dinner, if you please. Nothing formal and nothing serious. We may all be bankrupt tomorrow, divorced or dead. <laughs> but tonight we'll be gay. That is the invariable rule of this house. <laughs> Now, me for the cooking apron. Oh, Harris, you're to go into the kitchen and bring in the hors d'oeuvre. Right you are. May I be of any help? Oh, thank you, Maud, darling, of course. Mrs. Cheever, yes, yes. you might come along, too. Oh, you want me. There, now. Oh, darling, please tie me up in back, will you? Oh, yes. There you are. Fine, thank you. Now, to get these rings off... Soap and water always seem to do it. Oh. <laughs> there. There we are. The rings are so beautiful. Oh, thank you. They're very nice. But there's only one that's very valuable. The sapphire. It's beautiful. Oh, uh, let me see. Oh, it must be very valuable. Mm-hmm. It cost 10000 six years ago. It's been my talisman ever since. For the moment, however, I am cook. Wait. Are you going to leave the rings out like that? <laughs> of course, silly temptation, you know. Oh. <laughs> now, uh, now I am the cook. Maud Lyle, you are scullery maid. Harris is the chef, and we're all under his orders. Uh, Mrs. Cheever, did you ever peel onions? Good heavens, no. <laughs> there are no onions to peel. All you have to do is help to set the table. Well, <laughs> Under their hostess's gay guidance, the seven guests began to circulate busily through the rooms, laying the table, grouping the chairs, arranging the flowers, and preparing the material for the chafing dishes. Mrs. Kildare, in the kitchen, ransacked the icebox, and with her own hands, shredded the chicken and measured the cream. Flanders! Oh, please, Flanders, here, yes? carry this in carefully. Now, don't... I've got it with my life. Oh, good boy. Oh, Cheever, stop watching your wife and put that salad bowl on the table. Everything ready, Harris? All set. Good. All right. All right now. Everyone, everyone sit down. I'll be right in. She went into her bedroom, took off her apron and hung it in the closet. Then going to her dressing table, she drew the hat pin around which were her rings from the pin cushion and carelessly slipped them on her fingers. All at once, she frowned and looked quickly at her hand. Only two rings were there. The third ring, the sapphire, was missing. Stupid. She returned to her dressing table. Immediately, she stopped. She remembered quite clearly putting the hat pin through the three rings. She made no attempt to search further, but remained without moving, her fingers slowly drumming on the table, her head to one side, her lips drawn in a little between her teeth, listening with a frown to the babble from the outer room. Who had taken the ring? Each of her guests had had a dozen opportunities in the course of the time that she'd been busy in the kitchen. Too much time before the mirror, dear lady. Well, it's not Flanders. Then she reconsidered. Well, why not? He's clever. No. Oh, I've got to think. To gain time, she walked back slowly to the kitchen, her head bowed in thought, it's thumb between her teeth. Who has taken it? She ran over the characters of her guests and their situations as she knew them. Strangely enough, at each, her mind stopped upon some reason that might explain a sudden temptation. Well, I'll find out nothing this way. That's not the important thing to me just know. The important thing is to get that ring back. And slowly, deliberately, she began to walk back and forth, her clenched hand beating the deliberate, rhythmic measure of her journey. Five minutes later, as Harris, installed as chef over the chafing dish, was giving directions, spoon in the air, Mrs. Kildare came into the room like a lengthening shadow. Her entrance had been made with scarcely a perceptible sound, and yet each guest was aware of it at the same moment, with a little nervous start. <laughs> oh, heavens, dear lady, you came in on us like a Greek tragedy. What is it you have for us, a surprise? I have, I have something to say to you. Mr. Enos Jackson... Yes, Mrs. Kildare. Kindly do as I ask you. Why, sir. Go to the door. Go to the door? Please. Yes? Lock it and bring me the key, please. Some kind of a game. There you are. 
Thank you. And now the bedroom door. Would you do the same? Of course. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Uh, mm. Mr. Cheever? Yes? Would you blow out all the candles except the candelabrum on the table? Blow out all the candles? Except the candelabrum. <laughs> For goodness sakes, Mrs. Kildare, what is it? I'm getting terribly worked up. My nerves... Maud Lyle! Oh, yes? Put the candelabrum on this table. Here. No, no, wait a minute. Mr. Jackson? Yes? First, clear off the table, please. I, I want nothing on it. <laughs> That's it. Now, now, please, put down the candelabrum. Well, that's the last candle. All right. Now, listen. My sapphire ring has just been stolen. What? Oh, you're joking. Oh, what? Oh, what? Oh, what do you mean, Mrs. The ring has been taken within the last 20 minutes. I'm not going to mince words. The ring has been taken, and the thief is among you. Oh, Mrs. Kildare. Oh, stolen? Oh, but, Mrs. Kildare, is it possible? Absolutely, Mrs. Cheever. There's not the slightest doubt. Three of you were in my bedroom when I placed my rings on the pincushion. Each of you has passed through there a dozen times since. My sapphire ring is gone, and one of you has taken it. Oh, I don't know. Oh, that's quite true. I was in the room when she took them off. The sapphire ring was on top. Now, listen. I'm not going to mince words. I'm, I'm not going to stand on ceremony. I'm, I'm going to have that ring back. Now, dear lady... Listen to me. I'm going to have that ring back, and... And until I do, not a soul shall leave this room. I don't care who's taken it. All I want is my ring. Now, I, I'm going to make it possible for whoever took it to restore it without possibility of detection. The doors are locked, and they'll stay locked. I am going to blow out the remaining candles in the candelabrum, and I am going to count to 100 slowly. You'll be in absolute darkness. No one will know or see what is done. Oh, yeah. But if at the end of that time the ring is not here on this table... I shall telephone the police and have everyone in this room searched. Am I quite clear? I, I, I just can't believe that. Everyone take his place about the table, please. That's Excuse it. me, please. That will do very nicely. Now, I, I will blow out the candles and count 100. No more, no less. Remember, either I get that ring or everyone in this room will be searched. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty. 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70. 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78. The ring. 79. 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100. Mr. Cheever, you may give it to me. Well, well, now, now that that's over, we can have a very gay little supper. Harris, Harris, will you please help me light these candles? <laughs> And, uh, there you are, gentlemen. Well, I, I say, Peter's old boy, that's not all. Absolutely. <laughs> the story ends there? The story ends there. But, uh, who took the ring? Uh-huh. What, it was never found out? Never. No clues? None. I'm not sure I like the story. <laughs> it's no story at all. Oh, permit me, it is a story, and it is complete. In fact, I consider it unique, because it has none of the banalities of a solution. 
leaves the problem even more confused than at the start. Well, well I don't see... Of course what? you don't, my dear Rankin. You do not see that any solution would be commonplace, whereas no solution leaves a true intellectual problem. How so? Well, in the first place, uh, whether the situation actually happened or not, which is in itself a mere triviality, Peters has told it in a masterly way, the proof of which is that he's made he listen. Let's observe. Now, each person present might have taken the ring. Mm. Flanders, a broker, just come a cropper. Maud Lyle, a woman on the ragged side of life in desperate means. Either Mr. and Mrs. Cheever, suspected of being card sharps, and a very good touch there, too, Peters. Mr. Enos Jackson, a sharp lawyer, or his wife, about to be divorced. Even Harris, concerning whom very cleverly Peters has said absolutely nothing mm, to make him quite the most suspicious of all. There are, therefore, seven solutions, all possible, all logical. But beyond this is left a great intellectual problem. How so? Was it a feminine or a masculine action to restore the ring when threatened with a search? Knowing that Mrs. Kildare's clever expedient of throwing the room into darkness made detection impossible? Or was it a woman who lacked the necessary courage to continue? Or was it a man who repented his first impulse? Is a man or is a woman a greater natural criminal? <laughs> That's simple, Quinny. A woman took it, of course. Oh, on the contrary, it was a man. For the first action was more difficult than the first. A uh, man, certainly. The restoration of the ring was a logical decision. Well, I recognize most of those characters, Peters. Mrs. Kildare, of course, is all you say of her. Extraordinary woman. Story's quite characteristic of her. Flanders, I'm not quite sure of, but I think I know him, too. I'm positive I do. Uh, did it really happen? Exactly as I've told it. The only one I don't recognize is Harris. Your humble servant. What? You, Peters? You were there? I was there. Pardon me, gentlemen. Oh, yes, uh, what is it, John? Mr. Peters, sir, your train. You told me to remind Oh, uh, yes, thank you. I didn't know it was so late. Uh, will you gentlemen pardon me? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, of course, Peters. Nice to have met you all. Hmm, curious chap. Extraordinary. Now, uh, I wonder... Hmm. <laughs> I wonder if we're wondering the same thing, gentlemen. Suspense! And so closes 100 in the Dark. Peters was played by Howard Duff, and the other club members were Joseph Kearns, Frank Albertson, John McIntyre, Dick Ryan, and Horace Willard. Teresa Marshall was Rita Kildare, and at her party were Jeanette Nolan, Wally Mayer, Mary Jane Croft, Jerry Hausner, and Grace Gillern. Tonight's study in suspense, presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's favorite wines. If you could see how Roma California wines are grown, you'd understand why they are America's favorite wines. First, you'd see how Roma selects and presses only the choicest grapes. Then how Roma master vintners with ancient skills and unmatched winemaking resources guide this luscious grape goodness unhurriedly to tempting perfection. Finally, these better tasting Roma wines are placed with other mellow Roma wines to await later selection for your enjoyment from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines. This is Truman Bradley with a suggestion for making your Thanksgiving dinner even more enjoyable. Top off the meal with glasses of fruity Roma Port. Roma Port is a truly distinguished entertainment wine, ruby red, full-bodied, clear as a bell. Be sure to ask for Roma. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines. Thank you. Tonight's Suspense Radio Play was adapted by Jack Fink from a short story by Owen Johnson. Suspense. Produced and directed by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.